So as you guys know, we have Alejandro Duenas on the podcast again today for the second time. Um, a lot of people actually, when I posted um, if they had any questions for you, we got quite a bit of questions. So that's great because I guess they listened to the first episode that you were on and really resonated with all that you do. So we're really excited to have you on. So thank you for coming. Yeah, I am so excited. It's been a year. I feel like we're in a completely different place than we were a year ago. So I'm so excited. I also want to mention we actually, after the first episode we did, got a review like dedicated to that one episode. Oh, it was like, shout out to this one episode. Like it really changed my mindset. And it was in the midst of like the pandemic as well. So I think people like really resonated with what we spoke about. But anyways, yeah, just wanted to put oh my that gosh. out there. <laughs> Had, I had a lot of your followers like come my way and like seek seek support or like ask, oh love that ask questions um and it was just really beautiful so I didn't know there was oh so much to do about that episode I'm, I'm so happy that's so nice I'm glad to hear that um okay so I don't know if we did this last time but um I was reading into a little bit more about you and you're, you're such like a great teacher and you have so much wisdom and your captions on your posts. It's, uh, it's like, I'm reading like a book. It's, it's just so great. So I came across one of your posts and it talks more about you and your background and where you were seven years ago compared to where you are now. And I've been doing also a lot of just like listening to other podcasts and people who are therapists or spiritual healers always talk about how they've kind of endured so much and that's why they're able to kind of help people today. So I guess I kind of want to dive into, if you're okay with it, a little more about you. Like where were you at this like seven years ago timeline and how do you, how did you get to where you are now today helping other women and, and men? Yeah, totally. Seven years ago, I was in a place where I was just really, really depressed. It was like my lowest point of depression that I have ever experienced was about seven years ago. Okay. Um, and for me, it the depression came from a lot of different sources. Um, for one of them being, I was someone who was very resentful. Like I would kind of envy a lot of people and resent them. Or if someone did one little thing to me, it would bother me so much. And I would like really hold it in um my boyfriend of eight years now he was he went through my experience of depression so his poor soul has been through like every Aww. phase that I've been through um so even with him it was a lot of arguments a lot of like me creating chaos out of nothing and mm -hmm. really feeling a lot of anger inside mm -hmm. I would um you know see other people's lives and kind of like resent that or envy that and I kept it all bottled up inside so I was like you know, if you knew me seven years ago, you never would have thought that any of this was going on um, because I was always so happy and so positive and like that friend that gave great advice to everyone else. Right. Um, and I didn't really share what was going on internally. And also at that time, like I didn't really understand depression in the first place. So I didn't know, like, is it something to talk about with your friend? Is it something to open up with, with other people? Like that was my first time really experiencing it. So I didn't really know to seek help until I actually did. But mm. when I was first experiencing, I didn't know to seek help. I didn't know who to talk about. So I kind of kept a lot of bottled up emotions on the inside. Um, and it also came from not only envy and resentment and anger. It also came from my parents. My parents tend to be, especially my dad tends to be someone who like, if one little thing is done to him, he'll kind of just like have this stern face and you know, like it's bothering him deeply, but he'll never tell you kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's also the traits of my parents that I ended up having. Right. Um, and also school, I was in a place in my life, that was when I was 20 years old. So that I was at a place in my life where I had, um, I was going to school full time. I was working full time. I was living on my own, providing for myself financially. So it was just a lot. Wow. It had a full time relationship, right? So there was just so many things going on in my life that it felt a lot easier to be the victim of my life and to kind of just focus on like, why me? Why does this happen to me? Why do some people have everything and I don't have it, right? Rather than choosing to be the creator of my life. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the the space that I was in, you know, seven years ago. Um, I can talk about the bright side, like what changed everything, but yeah. I don't know if you guys have any questions on that part first off. It's, I just want to touch on one thing you said, and it was about your parents. Mm -hmm. And so I was listening to something else. It was actually today. And so like, I, I didn't think about talking about this, but I was listening today and you just said it. So I feel like it's meant to be, but she was talking, this girl was talking about how like, 
um, anxiety or like depression obviously can be genetic, but like the trauma or traits of your parents or just like generations beyond your parents, like it's intergenerational. So if your dad or your mom acts a certain way, or like, let's say you're driving a car and your mom was always in the car and she's always like, oh my God, watch out, watch this, watch that. And then, then, then you kind of start embodying that trait as well, that anxiousness while driving, or like you said, that resentment, I guess, or that stern look holding in your emotions. Is that, do you find that that is the case with a lot of, I guess, the clients you work with is that their traumas or their anxieties or just their little kind of, how do I explain it? Like, yeah, also just to add to that. Also, I feel like we also learned how to like, not combat, but cope with certain like anxieties through how our parents did it. Like how you said, like your dad, like has a stern face and would never say how he felt. Like, I feel like we can relate because we came from a family that didn't really like very stern, very strong, very like, even now I'm kind of scared to like say my emotions to my friends. I'm always just holding it in and keeping it inside. So I also feel like it, it stems from how your parents deal with things. You kind of learn how to do the same. And basically I, I want to know if you see this in your clients as well. Is this like a, an actual thing? <laughs> yes, it is 1000% an actual thing inside of my signature program, the three C's method um, in module two, where we dive heavy into the healing work. Like one of the first things that we dive into is understanding that the trauma or all the healing work that you have to do today um, is based on the first five years that you experience. Like the first five years of your life um, it, this is like a scientific study that like the first five years of your life uh, make up 90% of who you are today. So 1000%, like the first five years, which essentially you spend with your parents or your caregivers, right? Anything that they are doing, you you are just a, a little ball of like taking in all this Sponge. information. Yeah. So that's like, you're just taking in everything that you're seeing and that's how you know how to respond to things. So it definitely makes sense that we can you know take on some of the traits that our parents have and in the same way our trauma comes from childhood even if we've had like the best parents ever um because as kids we have so many needs that need to be met and it is impossible for a parent to know all of a kid's needs it's not that they are good or bad it's just impossible and at a young age it's not like at one years old you're able to tell your mom like hey mom these are my needs can you like mm -hmm. meet for me right so when our needs aren't met up until age five, even up until age seven, um, we start showing up from a lack of those needs into the world. And that's how our trauma starts, you know, becoming a self-perpetuating cycle um, because those needs aren't met. And it's not it's not coming from a place of like blaming our parents of like, oh, you didn't meet my needs or, oh, you gave me these traits. It's simply a matter of understanding like that was just like how your life journey was meant to be. And now that you have these unmet needs, now that you have these maybe not so great traits, how can you work towards that without placing blame on anyone outside of mm -hmm. you, but simply doing the work on the inside? And this, sorry, no. no, I was going to say how you said the first five years kind of sets you up. It's kind of scary to me, like thinking that because I don't even remember, like, I feel like a lot of people don't remember yeah. age one to five. So it's almost like you're programmed to like act a certain way. And sometimes I get super fresh like today I, I'll, I'll be so blunt and transparent I had like an anxiety attack or like just I woke up just feeling anxiousness and it has something to do with like my self-esteem but for some reason I couldn't I didn't know like how to handle it or like where it came from and then when you say that it makes me think like did something in my first five years or in my early like childhood development make me feel or like program myself this way I don't know how to explain the way I was feeling but it's just weird and scary because a lot of people don't even remember like their childhood so it makes you think like well why am I like this or like, why am I thinking like this way yeah and it goes even deeper than that honestly like we could talk about this this could be a whole podcast within you know literally like childhood <laughs> this like, is what happens we just veer off childhood uh, like work yeah inner child. yeah inner child work yeah well I mean going even deeper it's not even just the first five years of your life it's also um why am I blanking out on the wor word it's also um generational trauma yeah. right so like it's even like your parents parents out and how they were treated the first five years of their life and like it's just a whole link it's mm -hmm. a whole chain of how we show up today is based on so much of the past um so that's why you know it can 
it can be really easy to get stuck in that victim mindset, which was kind of yeah. the space that I was in of like, why me? Like, why did I have these parents? You know, um, why am I experiencing this rather than kind of taking that radical responsibility and saying, okay, well, this is what I'm dealing with. No one externally, externally is going to save me. I ultimately save myself. So how can I now start doing the work? And for me, when I was in that really low place in my life, um, it was actually my sister who I have two older sisters and my oldest sister actually was seeing more of like what I was experiencing, the depression that I was in. Mm -hmm. And she's actually the one who introduced me to a spiritual life coach seven years ago. And um, I had never heard of a life coach before in my life. So I had no idea what it was, um, but I had the option of like, you know, speaking to this life coach for like 30 minutes for free and seeing if I wanted to move forward with it. And my sister was kind enough enough to like pay for the whole program so I didn't oh, have to oh, that's, that's um, really nice yeah and you know the coach seemed nice and amazing I still wasn't sure what I was getting myself into but I said yes and I did it and with the help of her and like many of the books that I was reading I was just finally starting to realize how much power I actually had over my life and how I could really turn things around if I chose to and I could let go of the resentment. I could work through that, work through the envy and actually become the creator of my life rather than the victim. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, a very short summary of kind of the journey of, you know, when I was in a place where I was very depressed. I don't think I mentioned this yet, but I was depressed to the point that I was suicidal. So Okay. I did not want to live anymore. And I was like thinking of ways to kill myself. Um, and then, you know, coming to a point where I realized, wait, I don't have to be the victim. I can create the life that I want and absolutely anything that I want to manifest can manifest if I choose to. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's an amazing story, honestly, because it comes full circle because now you are that person, that coach, or you can even say you're the kind of like that big sister to kind mm -hmm. of instill these things in so many other people and help other people realize that they can shift from that victim, I guess, mindset to the creator mindset, right? Like that's who you are to other people and that's what your programs offer. So I think that that's an amazing story because you you came full circle with it. Yeah, totally. And yeah. One, one other quick thing to mention is that for me, like I know nowadays it's like becoming more and more like... Um, popular or what's the word like up and coming um, to like really dive into spirituality more and like manifestation and all these different terms, um, which is great. But for me, I, I kind of grew up into this. So when I talk about my experience to my clients, I, I always share that I have over 10 years of experience because I grew up with two very spiritual aunts. So I grew up reading Deepak Chopra. I grew up uh, reading like Eckhart Tolle, like the books that are now being read. Um, I grew yeah. up in Reiki and like learning about the law of attraction and manifestation like 10 years ago. And yet seven years in yet seven years ago, you know, I had a very, I, I was going through a very depressive space in my life. And I like to share that because even though I knew all of these healing modalities, and even though I knew all this knowledge, it mm -hmm. still didn't stop me from experiencing depression. And it was mainly because I wasn't actually putting my knowledge to use. And I could mm -hmm. give great advice and help friends and all the things because I knew everything, but I didn't know how to take action or I wasn't ready to take action on it. So it had to, I had to go through that depression to finally realize, wait, like it, th I have the power, you know, like I have hold the key and I have to start implementing action if I really want to change my life. Um, so that, you know, that's a really key factor in my in my growth journey understanding right. that it wasn't just about reading all the books and getting all the knowledge and you know I was lucky and blessed to have been raised by two aunts of mine who were already into all of these topics but it's about applying that knowledge that you right. have it's the biggest thing and go ahead I was gonna say that kind of moves into like what we want to talk about next how <clears throat> excuse me manifesting has been kind of like mainstream like we see it sorry Yes, mainstream manifesting, but I just also want to say, I feel like it's become mainstream because so many people are going through, I mean, people have always been going through depression, anxiety, and mental health struggles, but I feel like, especially the last two years with this pandemic, I feel like people have really been identifying that that's what they've been going through because they've had to sit like inside for a long time or haven't mm -hmm. been able to see people and they're like, okay, like, I think I have anxiety or I think I'm depressed and 
a lot of us, because like even me, we've turned to these books and these like YouTube videos about manifesting and I'm not going to lie a lot, like from where I was at the beginning of the pandemic, I've grown spiritually a lot. However, for the amount of books I've read and the amount of manifesting that I've done in meditation, you'd think I'd be, I would think I'd be way further along. And I think it's because of what you just said that it's like, no matter how many books and all these things I'm reading, if you don't actually put it into action, then how is it really going to happen? Which brings me to ask what really is like embodiment? Because I know that you talk about Um, manifesting through embodiment but what exactly is that and how do you exactly do that yeah totally I think before answering that question I kind of have to talk about manifestation in the first place because there's there's a lot of misconceptions about manifestation and how it really works so I hope that for your listeners who are listening and are into manifestation they really get the gist of what this is really about right yes um So when it comes to manifestation, like one of the biggest misconceptions is that you simply just like think about it or you put it in a vision board and it's going to manifest. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, a lot of people can get so fixated on what's on the vision board. Let's say it's like the dream house, right? So they're Mm -hmm. thinking about the dream house constantly and they're like, you know, this is the law of attraction. This is me focusing on manifestation. I'm thinking about the dream house, thinking about it, thinking about it. So I'm going to manifest it and it has to come true. And um, this is where I kind of answer your question where manifestation is not so much about thinking about it more so than it is about feeling and embodying it. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you can think about something constantly and it can actually come from a scarcity mindset. It can actually come from a place of you fearing that you're not going to get that dream Mm -hmm. house. So you're constantly fixated on, I'm going to get that dream house. I'm going to get that dream house, but you're actually saying it from a place of fear or you're saying it from a place of like, lack yeah just from a place of lack where you don't truly believe it so you're like trying to convince yourself that you are so you're repeating Mm -hmm. it over and over again and the like the energy says it all so like your energy that that energy of lack and scarcity is not going to help you manifest that thing um you know if you want to manifest your dream house you can't just expect that you're just going to sit in a room and think about it often and it's all of a sudden going to come into fruition right so there's i would say like three main factors in manifestation which is thinking about it from a place of believing in it if you really know that you're going to get that dream house like if it's granted in your future in like five years from now you're going to have that dream house you wouldn't need to think about it every day right because you would already know like it's it's happening mm-hmm. right happening there's no need for like think like oh my god I need to manifest it because you already know right so it's thinking about it from a place of truly believing in it right that's when you start um vibrating at the frequency of abundance the second part is taking action right so a lot of the times it's like if you want that dream house well how are you going to start taking action that's going to get you towards you know succeeding or manifesting that goal Mm -hmm. and then the third part which is probably the most important which answers your question the embodiment part which means feeling the feelings within yourself like if your body your mind may know that you don't have the dream house now, but if your body knew that you have the dream house now, how would it feel? So the true key to manifestation is focusing on how you would feel like when that thing is manifested that you want to manifest, how could you feel that right now? So questions I would ask myself would be, okay, if I have that dream house, how would I feel? And how can you feel that emotion? right now and not just for a few minutes but as much as you possibly can right so feeling um feelings of joy of happiness of abundance of seeing a day in the life in your dream home and I don't know the biggest closet that you can imagine how does that feel or you know really tapping into your senses what do you smell around the house what can you feel around the house um things like that like what can you taste like really tapping into the future but not being fixated on it, but simply seeing it, believing that it's going to happen and bringing all of those emotions into your now. How can I feel that sense of happiness right now? How can I trick my body into believing that that I'm in that dream house right now? So how can I feel the emotions? How can I, you know, show up as my highest self, right? Which is Mm -hmm. a huge one, because if you have that dream house, you are probably feeling so empowered, so confident, so trusting and believing in yourself, right? So you need to show up as that version of yourself. And when you can do that, 
you're so going to attract that dream house, right? So you're thinking about it, you're taking action on it, but you're also embodying the energy of it. And that's how you attract it because like energy attracts like energy. So the more that you are vibrating at a frequency of abundance, of joy, of happiness, not only is that dream house going to come your way, so many other things that mm -hmm. you didn't even expect are going to come your way mm -hmm. because you're really opening up your perspective to all the abundance that's constantly around you. Does that answer the question? No, it does for sure. That with was the most like clear explanation, I think, of manifestation and like law of attraction that I've heard. There's so much out there that is like, you really have to like dig through all the mumbo jumbo of it all to really like get the clear picture, which is what you just said. I also really like how you said that like embodiment, like waking up every day and acting as if you already had what you have. So like, I don't know if I had my dream house, I'd be obviously very happy like you said I get up I go to the gym every morning I would make sure every morning is like how I would live if I already had that thing so I really like that because it also gives you motivation and like gives you kind of like a sense of like I want to say no I want to say green stuff but it's <laughs> like like what's it called like spirit like just motivation is the best way to say it I guess like just kind of like joy so I think embodying that is that's like a very good step-by-step -step process for somebody who like has no idea even what like manifestation is or how to do it yeah I, also, I think or go, oh, ahead. go ahead oh I, the, the word that comes to mind for me which is key in manifestation is gratitude like yeah. you just start to have so much gratitude for the world and the greater your gratitude the more that you are going to attract more things into your life as well so I think that is another key recipe towards manifesting and the law of attraction and you know one thing too that you mentioned earlier was that like you know with so many so much information and knowledge on manifestation and law of attraction it can be really discouraging to like put all these things in your vision board and like know that you want to manifest all these things in a certain time like in a month's time or whatever it is and then it not manifesting and it's just really discouraging and then mm -hmm. you get yourself to a place where you're like does this even work like how come it's happening to a whole bunch of other people but it's not working for me Mm -hmm. another key towards manifesting is also doing the inner work it's healing from your life's trauma because the I'm more that you're that. healing from the fear the more that you're he healing from the insecurities and all those things that are that are inside of you those are the things that are stopping you from manifesting as well um, even judgment the more you're focused on judging other people's lives and how much more they have than you that's that's stopping you from manifesting as well because you're just focusing on the lack rather mm -hmm. than the abundance I have, I have two questions. Sorry, I don't want to stick on this for too long, but I have two questions. Yeah. Firstly, I remember last time we spoke to you, you um, gave the analogy of like uh, um, emptying your cup before you can like fill it up with something new. So it was something along those lines. Like if you have a dirty cup, you can't fill it up with some mm -hmm. clean stuff and expect it to work. So you have to empty your cup first. So when I think about that in relation to manifestation or just kind of leading a happier more fulfilled life I think about people like even myself like going through our own shit so it's like how can I want or like desire or believe I'm going to get all these things that I really want while I'm still going through all these like really I guess crappy things like how how like there's two sides of the spectrum you know and I guess you kind of just answered it by saying you have to do the inner work first before I guess manifesting and expecting all these things to happen but can you touch on that a little bit like the kind of narrative between those two if that makes sense yeah definitely so um I think what I was telling you about back then was probably like the peanut butter jar it's like if you you know when there's like the way that I explain it to my clients now at least it's like a peanut butter jar where like you know you've scooped up all the peanut butter but there's still peanut butters along the edge oh, yeah. of the jar, that was it. and like you need to be able to like really clean it up for it to be clean right and manifestation goes hand in hand with healing and doing the inner work and clearing your trauma because yes exactly what you said if you have these insecurities and you don't believe in these things actually happening then it's not going to happen something i talk about often on my on my handle and um, with my clients as well is that you know affirmations don't work for everyone it's been statistically proven that affirmations for someone who's depressed actually makes them more depressed so there mm -hmm. was like three group studies and there's like one study of you know people who are depressed low self-esteem there's one group where they are you know have better self-esteem feel a little bit more confident and then there's like a middle group who are you know kind of secure within themselves not maybe not as confident and um 
Affirmations for the, the ones that were depressed made them more depressed. Affirmations for those who were very confident helped them tremendously. And then affirmations for those who were in the middle kind of helped them like in the middle, like it didn't really help mm -hmm. them too much or, or um, you know, it just stayed in between. And that's really important with manifestation too, because if you are putting on your vision board all these things that are actually so far out of reach, you know, like yeah. this is why affirmations don't help those may not help many who are really depressed because when they are saying all these positive things, they're actually focusing on how far away they are from it rather than how close they are from it. So they might say, That's oh, I am, you know, full of abundance and gratitude, but in reality, they're like, but I'm not, you know, so they're actually focusing on the not part. So when mm -hmm. manifesting, you know, you can place all these huge things in your vision board, but if you're not actually believing in it, right, you're actually moving further away from ever manifesting that. So when you are putting things in your vision board or wanting to manifest, it always does have to feel a little bit uncomfortable, but it also has to feel, it's like a mixture of doable, but also a little bit un uncomfortable in order right. for it to be like the specific ingredient. Um, because if it feels too far out of reach, you're just going to focus on that. And it's going to come from a lack mindset, which won't attract what it is you want. That makes sense. It's like you're hoping for these things on this board. You don't actually think you're gonna you're gonna ever get them because they're so far off. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I agree. Um, before moving on to like what you want to ask, do you have a vision board? Do you use vision boards or like how do you specifically do them? Like I, for example, this year kind of took that advice and I put things on there that I guess I don't want to say were achievable, but were like realistic. I didn't put like the I don't know, a hundred thousand dollar car. I think I can have in like years from now, but I put things that like make me happy, like little things that I want to change. Like for example, horse, I put a picture of a horse on there, never ridden a horse before, but it's just, I feel like, um, overcoming my fear of animals is going to make me happier. So I put a picture of a horse and I've been volunteering with horses. So that's one thing I'm doing. That's different from previous vision boards that I've had, like more materialistic things that I eventually do want, you know? So what do you do? I guess is what's your strategy? <laughs> Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that, that you're working with horses and volunteering. Um, that's I'm beautiful. trying. <laughs> love horses. Um, but yeah, so I, I think it changes periodically. Like I haven't had like a full on vision board in maybe like two years, meaning like a vision board where I am like putting absolutely everything that I want out of life. The mm -hmm. most recent one that I did for this year was actually just focused on the year. So I made a vision board for the year of like the things that I want to attract in the year. And it's actually like my computer's uh, wallpaper. Mm -hmm. um, That's a minus too. <laughs> and I think I more so vision boards are great. Um, but it's also vision boards are great for those who are visual, right? Um, I don't know if you guys know much about human design, but based on my human design, I'm um, more of a feeling kind of person. So I actually mm -hmm. do focus more on the feeling. Like I will set my goals that I want to accomplish, you know, for the year of 2022, for example. Oh my gosh, which by the way, I love that today we're recording on 2 2 I know, oh, I, I know. I that too before, <laughs> before we started. Yes. I was like, wow, this is meant to be. <laughs> I know it's so aligned. Um, but yeah, I like will focus on the year's goals and then I'll put like a few pictures of like what I want to manifest. And actually what I focus more so instead of just like, not that there's anything wrong with um, putting down like material things. I think what I focus more on in my vision boards personally is like the feeling of things. So if I want to feel like joy and happiness, I will like post a picture of someone who has like her arms wide open and she's like so happy in the picture. To me, those are the things that really like help me become more magnetic with my manifestations, but it is very unique to everyone. And there's nothing wrong with like putting a car in a designer handbag or anything that you want in your vision board. Um, but for me, I think I really tap more into like the feeling of things. Of it. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's move on for manifestation because we want to touch on what you said, overcoming jealousy. Yeah, so you said in the beginning um, with your journey, like you felt resentment towards people or other people's lives. And I feel like everybody who's listening and like even us, we've had a point in our life where we've been jealous of like something, whether it's somebody else or what we lack or just whatever, whatever it may be. So I saw your post on tips on kind of overcoming that. And I wanted to like, wanted you to share that more in depth about how to overcome the feeling of it and kind of ask yourself, like, why am I feeling this way rather than just projecting it, like envy feelings on other people and even just towards like 
just the vibes you give off, like towards other people, towards yourself, towards friends, family, whatever the case may be. So what are your like main tips to kind of overcoming it and then kind of reflecting why someone's feeling this way? Yeah, totally. Um, I love this question. So with jealousy and envy and, you know, especially nowadays with so much access to social media, it's so easy to compare our lives to someone else's. Um, and there's always two mindsets that I take that you can take away from comparison. So the first one, which is the one that is, I would say that negatively impacts your life is when you choose to see, you know, a beautiful influencer's life on Instagram and you real you start to kind of feel like this sort of anger because maybe she's doing something that you kind of are doing too mm -hmm. or she has something similar to you and like you start to build this anger even you even though you may not even know the person right the influencer per se um but you start to get these feelings because you're more so focusing on the lack you're more so focusing on like how much you don't have in comparison to her um right. And you get to a place where you can't even celebrate maybe that influencer's accomplishments or her wins, right? Because you're so focused on like being so far away from that. And mm -hmm. usually with that person, with that mindset, we come from a place of feeling like, you know, well, I deserve more than her. Like I have worked harder than her. I have done this more and this right. and that more. Like how does she have all of those things? And I don't, that's where jealousy and envy comes from, right? When we use that one <laughs> mindset, when we're comparing ourselves, now, the positive mindset that we should be using when we're comparing ourselves is, and this comes hand in hand with manifestation as well, is realizing that everything that we're seeing that, that, it, that will more positively impact your life is realizing that seeing that influencer and her amazing, beautiful life and all the abundance that she has around you, the reason that you're seeing that is because the universe, source, God, whoever you believe in is hinting at you that that is possible for you as well. It's hinting at you that if you see it in your reality, that means it is possible in your reality. And Which it's not just possible for just one person. It's possible. Yeah and for so many other people so changing your mindset from focusing on the lack when you're comparing someone comparing yourself to someone changing it to actually focusing on wait she has all of that I can have all of that too if she has it it means I can too and coming from a place of when, when you come from that mindset it becomes easier to to celebrate the other person so you can actually celebrate the other person when she has I don't know like 100k followers or a million follower followers right when she has these milestones you can actually feel happy for the other person genuinely because you know that not only is that great for her but that is just showing you so much abundance that's headed your way as well mm -hmm. so that's I would say those are the two mindsets when it comes to comparison one that we tend to always go to which is the one that negatively impacts us right right and the one that we should go to which is the positive impact and just seeing all these different experiences as our possibility and our potential now, when it comes to reflecting on the inside, I think it's always important to, to address what anything that triggers you in your life, first of all, is always has more to do with you than the other person. Granted that the other person could be saying a lot of mean, awful things to you, but the reason it's triggering you in the first place is because you have insecurities, you have mm -hmm. wounds, you have something going on where you are allowing what that person is saying to get to you, right? right? If someone was confident and empowered in themselves, no matter how many people came up to that person saying, oh, you're ugly, you're stupid, you're whatever, that person would feel like, would be like, okay, you can think that, you know, she wouldn't even need to explain herself because she feels confident. She feels good within herself, right? So she's not triggered. She's not bothered. But the person who is triggered or the person who is bothered is allowing those comments to come in because there's wounds, there's insecurities mm -hmm. there, right? So when we are envious of someone or jealous of someone, it's important to understand that trigger because that's a trigger within itself, feeling jealous of someone, right. right? So a really good question to ask yourself is, what within me is unhealed that is causing me to feel so triggered by this person? right? What within me is unhealed? When you can take radical responsibility of your life and realize 
this person is doing this, yes, and it may be good or it may be bad, but I have control of how I can feel about it. That's the one thing that you have control over, your emotions. So you can allow that to hurt you or you can allow that to not hurt you and just keep on moving by, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're feeling jealous, ask yourself the question, like, what is unhealed within me? Do I see this person as prettier than me? Do I have insecurities within myself? Do I see her having so much more? Because, you know, I grew up in a lot of lack, you know, and it usually comes from a place of, of comparing what you don't have in relation to the other person. So this is something, you know, another thing that goes hand in hand, just like manifestation goes hand in hand with doing the healing work, healing from comparison and jealousy and envy also goes hand in hand with doing the inner healing work. The more that we are healing those insecurities, those wounds, the less we're going to be triggered, the less we're going to even give any focus to jealousy because we're right. just not really worried about that. And this reminds me of the book, The Four Agreements, um, where it says, don't take anything personally. So if somebody just like flipping it, if let's just say like me, if somebody's talking bad about me or, or saying something to me, it's almost like don't take it personally because that's a reflection of how they feel of themselves. And I feel like that goes hand in hand. You can't take anything personally when you do have jealousy, like you said, you it's a reflection of like myself or some like whoever is jealous, you can look inside and think like, well, why am I saying this or why am I jealous? So I think that that relates very well. Totally. I love that book, by the way. That's oh my like God, it's such book. a good book. Yeah. yeah. That's another book that I like basically grew up reading in, in Spanish and in English, but um, no, it makes total sense. Like we show up in the world, we project our own insecurities, our own unhealed traumas, our own wounds to other people. So the more that we can just realize the, the sole fact that we are acting based on our traumas, the less that we're going to take things personally, because mm -hmm. we're going to realize, okay, that person is acting that way. And maybe, yes, yeah, she is saying a lot of hurtful things to me and whatever it is, but that's probably the kind of you know, chatter that she has inside of her head. Those are probably mm -hmm. things that she tells herself. That's probably how, you know, rude or mean she may be to herself, or maybe that's how her mother um, would treat her, right? So it's understanding that like, hey, this person just needs to do her own healing work, not from an ego place where you're just like, whatever, you need to do your own work, but like from a place of understanding, like she's just wounded and that person is just acting based on that. And that's not to say that like, it's okay to accept things it's not saying that like it's okay to have a boyfriend who mistreats you because you know he has unhealed um trauma or wounds right it's you also have to hold your boundaries and know what's okay for you um but understanding that people just act based on their wounds and their unhealed trauma gives you that greater sense of of no longer taking things personally i love that i, I yeah i agree and just to like as a final thought to this point um like, I just want to know and just be fully transparent. Like, I also think that like, since starting the podcast, I can't speak for friend, but like a podcast takes like a lot of work and it doesn't seem like it would, like, it seems like you would just be like recording and uploading and that's it. And like, I feel like because like, we're not providing an actual service, again, this is probably like my imposter syndrome talking, but I feel like we're not providing anything that someone can like really buy like or whatever. So us trying to grow our following or just grow our community just because we want them to hear people like you or like what we have to say. Like sometimes I'm like, okay, like why would people want to like follow us just to hear us speak? We're not really providing them anything. So I get into that mindset and then I see other podcasters do like really, really well. And then I, I get that like, I don't want to say it's jealousy, but it's anger. I'm just like, why? And then I think that me being able to identify like, okay, it makes me angry because I have imposter syndrome that I'm never going to get there is like the first step to me, like healing from why I get angry at those things and why I want to like try so hard at everything that has to do with the podcast, you know? So um, I don't know. That's just me being fully transparent with the listeners and just, I think identifying that like and taking the first step is identifying that you like you feel that way you feel that anger towards like another podcast or another whoever you whatever you do another person in your company or whatever it is I think identifying it is like crucial for me I think I don't necessarily feel that way because I feel like we're on our own journey just like everybody else is who's starting a business or a podcast or whatever they may be doing like you got to take what you have and what you've been doing and just continue with it and obviously you will attract like-minded people and people who like you we've attracted you we've attracted other guests other followers in the past year so I think like standing from the podcast point of view I just feel like 
it's a journey and like everything you do is a journey. And obviously I get jealous too, like of certain things, but like you said, I'm really going to take what you said and put it to practice. Like it's an internal thing, work on it on the inside and also realize that the people who are saying bad things to me, it's also something that they may have to work on. And like you said, like, don't not like you have to work on this, but just kind of realizing that like, okay, they need work. I need work. And just kind of like settling it within. So I think that's very important. Yeah. And I mean, I so honor you both for like being open and sharing that like, hey, I do have imposter syndrome or I do also feel jealous sometimes or compare myself. It is a normal human thing Mm -hmm. for us to go through that. Um, But it's almost taboo to say that like, oh my God, I'm jealous. Like I would like, I would never before be like, yeah, like comparing myself to someone else made me feel jealous or angry. I feel like no one really says that they're jealous anymore, but everyone, everyone has that feeling. Everyone knows what jealousy feels like, right? Yeah, exactly. It's like, everyone wants to kind of put up this front, right? Of like, oh, I'm jealous. I don't compare myself to others, but we do that. And it's very human. I still do that every now and then. I think the biggest takeaway for your listeners is realizing that instead of focusing on the fact of like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm getting jealous. Like that's a bad thing. See it as a good thing. See it as like, oh my gosh, I'm getting jealous. That means there's more inner work for me to dive into. That means there's more things that I need to work on within myself. So I don't, so I don't feel jealous that much anymore, you know? So it's right. completely normal and just start to see it as a good thing because it's like the universe giving you signs of like, hey, you still need to work on this or you still need to work on that. And the more that you're working on that, the more those feelings of jealousy will be less of intensity. That makes sense. Yeah, that that's, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think that's really crucial just going forward with everyone, whoever listens to this, I think everyone can take that advice and just apply it to, to any, anywhere in their life. But, um, so thank you for that. Thank you for explaining all of that. Of course. Um, before we, I know, sorry, we like ran long, we kind of like veered off asking you a bunch of questions, but I really want to ask you about money healing. And for those of you listening, um, I feel like this is a term that not a lot of people have heard before, like, like money healing. When you hear that, you're like, (laughs) but the way I thought, think of money healing is like kind of navigating the relationship you have with money. I think a lot of people are scared, like whether they have a lot of money or no money at all and they're broke, they're scared of making moves that have to do with money. They're scared of making decisions. And um, everyone talks about, you know, thinking that abundance mindset when it comes to money and that's how you'll attract more money. But it's like, how, you know, like if you have no money, how am I going to think about more money? And it's just going to come. It's like what you said about the affirmations. Like if you're coming from a place of lack and then I say like, I want I am going to have $100,000 by next week. It's like, I'm not going to actually have that. So it makes me more sad kind of thing. So, yeah. So I guess I kind of want to know how can you shift from that lack and fear mindset when it comes to money and turn it into, I guess, an abundance mindset that may actually be able to help you attract opportunities that will then bring in more money. And do, do do you have any experience with it yourself? Yes, totally. This is all of like module five inside the three C's method. So the way that I like to call it is like money trauma. Like we all, you know, going back to our parents, right? Like based on the way our parents handled money, we start to get those same traits, right? We might be feel fearful of money. Like like my mom was someone who would, even if she didn't have money, she would still spend it. And my dad was the one who would like keep everything and keep his savings and not spend any of the money. So it's like completely two opposite, um, polar opposites when it came to their money mindset. And so I would go from one direction to another. I would sometimes be a little bit more like my mom, sometimes more like my dad. Um, But anyway, it all comes, it's it's a trauma within itself, right? Because many of us nowadays feel, um, can feel guilty when spending money or um, feel like, you know, those dreams that we want are so far out of reach and we won't really get there. Or it brings us anxiety to even talk about money, to even look at at our bank accounts and look at what's in our debit account, right? Um, The biggest way to, to healing your money trauma is first, One of the first steps that's worked on inside of the three C's method, my signature program is actually addressing those wounds, like taking time to consider how did my mom handle money? How did my dad handle money? Um, You know, how did I grow up? Like, did all those things influence how I am today, right? Gaining awareness on how the past has influenced you today is really important. And I would say the second part of it, which is really powerful, is creating a relationship with money like literally like a romantic relationship, right? If you're in a romantic relationship, you are 
thinking about the other person constantly, you are texting the other person, you are going on dates with the other person. And that's the same way that you should treat money. A lot of us, you know, or I see a lot of people coming from a place of wanting to manifest more, more money, but they're too scared to look into their debit account and face the reality of what's there, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at it, right, from a relationship basis, how are you supposed to have a good relationship with your partner if you're ignoring it and not really choosing to look at it, right? Right. So if you want a good relationship with money, then you need to be honest with what your re monetary reality is, right? You need to look at your account and work through any insecurity or any anxiety you might get when you are looking at your debit account or credit account, right? You need to work through that and work on building a good relationship with money. You need to think about your partner often. So you need to think about money often, right? So constantly repeat affirmations that money comes to you easily mm -hmm. and effortlessly, or that money supports your happiness and supports your freedom, or simply that you have an amazing relationship with money, right? It's like the way that you would think about your partner multiple times during your day, you need to think about money, not from a place of lack, which we've already discussed, but from a place mm -hmm. of feeling so abundant and truly believing and knowing that you have the best relationship with money, right? Even going on dates with money, like going on dates where like, maybe you do splurge on something if you can, right? I'm not telling you to like, get in, get in so much debt and just right. use all <laughs> But like splurge on something and feel good about it. Work on feeling good and like you earn it and deserve it rather than feeling anxious about making such a big investment mm -hmm. in something, right? Um, going on dates like or going on dates could also look like just you going to a park and like soaking up all the abundance that's around you. Um, gratitude is a big one, right? Feeling grateful for everything that's around you. That's how you go from healing your trauma to having a better relationship with money. It's like really seeing it as an actual relationship. And, you know, are you, if you're feeling guilty when you're spending money, it's like the way that I see it is like you feeling guilty, like telling your parents who your partner is or, or like showing off mm -hmm. your partner, like he, this is my partner, right? You, you wouldn't be ashamed or guilty. You would be like, right. this is my amazing partner. He or she is like, great, whatever it is. Right. So when you are spending, that money, you should feel that greatness of like, I'm so happy to be spending this money. Like me and money have such a good relationship that as I'm giving this to someone else, I am going to get double that in mm. no time. Right. It's like believing and being so like in such a romantic stage, like in a honeymoon stage with money, that mm. that's how you're going to attract it. And it's not just with money, it's with anything, forming a solid relationship with it. And I think this kind of touches on also what I said about the jealousy thing. Um, I feel like there's a lot of people who are scared or don't want to admit that they like, that they love money because there's this thing like money doesn't buy happiness, which could be true. But I personally think that money can contribute to happiness, not because I want all this money so that I can buy all these like amazing things. But I, I genuinely think if I had all the money that like when I close my eyes and I manifest myself having I could help my family I could give my mom and my dad trips to who knows where make them happy I can go to a country abroad and like build water wells in Africa or something like that because I have the money to do that and I think that a lot of people do, just don't want to admit that they want money and they love money and that's like honestly how I am too sometimes like I I really I, I like it and I'm scared to sometimes admit that and like sometimes when I'm talking about money or how I can make more how I want to make more doing certain things with the podcast or whatever it is I feel like people are judging me right so I think that correct me if I'm wrong that's kind of like something that I would have to work on is like letting go of being afraid that people are going to judge me for kind of pursuing making more money if that makes sense yes that makes total sense um uh what I wanted to say there is that like yeah like if you are coming from this place of like feeling ashamed of even telling other people that you love money, right? Like that's an insecurity that needs to be worked on. Same way we talked about jealousy. So it needs to be worked on, but not only that, like another key factor, um, another key factor towards being 
healing your money traumas and like being in a better space with abundance and manifestation, it's also about checking in with who you're surrounding yourself with, right? If you want to be like, for me, for example, right? If I am currently a six figure coach, if I want to be a seven figure coach, but I am surrounding myself with people who make less than six figures, right? It's, it's not allowing me to grow as much right? Because I am surrounded by people who have maybe like a smaller mentality when it comes to money. They might have a mindset of like, oh yeah, I'm going to work my corporate nine to five and keep making five figures for years and years and years, right? So that's their mindset. And even as I'm hanging out with them, right, I am receiving that kind of energy. And maybe in a table where everyone's making five figures, I would definitely feel uncomfortable saying like, I can't wait to make seven figures, right? Mm -hmm. Because it almost feels like it just doesn't fit in. So I think too, with manifestation and forming a relationship with money, not to say that you have to, you know, surround yourself with people who are all wealthy, but you have to surround yourself with people who have the mindset of believing in their worth and who have the mindset of like, even if they're making five figures or less, they know that they can make seven figures, right? So it's like, are you surrounding yourself around people who you would feel comfortable saying, I love money and I can't wait to manifest money? Or are you surrounding yourself with people who are maybe close more close minded when it comes to money and feel guilty around it. So then you saying that would feel so awkward for them. Right? right. So it's not only internal work for you to do, but also it's, it's a good thing to also check in with the people around you and saying like, are, you know, are my, the five people that I hang out with the most, are they coming from a good money mindset? Are they coming from an abundant space or are they focused on scarcity and fear? Because if they are, then that's not going to allow me to grow. If I keep hanging out with them, I'm going to keep, you know, stooping down to that level and it's right. not going to allow me to rise up and be around people who are successful, who are maybe entrepreneurs and are making seven figures. When you can surround yourself around people who are at a higher level monetarily wise, which is what you want to embody, it becomes that much more possible for you. You feel like it's so much more doable for you because you see the people around you having that same kind of um, financial freedom. I really like that. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh, sorry, I know we're going a little bit over time here. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, but I have one more question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Do you? I'll, I'll speak after you. Okay. It, it also relates to one of the questions that we got in when we, um, uh, when we asked everyone if they had any questions for you. And... Mm -hmm. Uh, kind of ties into this too. Let me just go back to it one sec. Um, so when you kind of, I guess you would have to have a good relationship with money to do this, but there's a lot of people who are kind of like, how do I get that confidence in myself to take the leap from switching <clears throat> from maybe one career to the next or like from corporate to maybe what you do or whatever it is. I guess in your personal experience, how was your relationship with money when you did that, right? Because I know I, I read a post and you said that you, I think you went from corporate to, to doing this, to coaching. And I'm assuming that going from corporate to coaching, you'd have to kind of take maybe a, a pay cut or you'd have to kind of sacrifice a couple of things before actually earning the money that you ought to earn. So can you speak on that and how you kind of made that leap and how you felt um, and your relationship with money was throughout that time? Yes, of course. So honestly, um, when I share this, it's not because I had the best relationship with money, but it's because I was so committed to making what I wanted become a reality. So I quit my corporate nine to five where I was making five figures, but it was like salary that I was making consistently, you know, didn't have to worry about it. Um, mm -hmm. And I decided to quit um, and, and move forward with this coaching thing that I was just getting started with. And I had no way to pay rent the next month. I had no way to pay for food the next month. I had no way to pay for anything the next month because once, you know, I quit my corporate job, I was done getting payments from them. But I am personally just the kind of person who likes to take risks. And I was at a point where I was so unhappy with my corporate job that I chose to believe in myself above all else. So it's not to say that I had like an amazing relationship with money because I didn't. I still had a lot of like wounds to go through um, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of healing to do around money. But I was so focused on paying rent. I was kind of like in survival mode. I was like, okay, I have a month to make shit happen. I have a month to like pay for my bills and do what I need to do. So I had almost like, it was almost like very encouraging me to 
encouraging for me to quit my corporate job just like that, because I was like given so much motivation to make it happen in a month. And I didn't have time per se to focus on the insecurities. I didn't have time to focus on, well, what if it doesn't work out? Like, what if this doesn't happen or that doesn't happen? I would, I just chose to believe in myself no matter what. And every single day I showed up on Instagram, even though I was so insecure to talk on stories, you know, over two years ago and say the things that I wanted, but I was so committed to making ends meet. And I would, at the time, I think I just needed just like a couple of, of clients to be able to pay for rent. So I was just like, okay, like I just need to make this certain number of clients. I'm going to do it. And, you know, I remember the first few times, like I had to go through like 15 or I don't even remember how long, but definitely more than 10 clients telling me no on a sales call like directly, like straight, straight back to back telling me no, 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 no. Until I finally started getting yes. Right. And most Mm. people might give up after their ninth call. People say no, but I didn't, I didn't have that option. I was like, Mm -hmm. I am not giving up. I'm continuing to do it. So I, you know, just, I just believed in myself so much that that was the main thing that helped me get to the space that I needed to be. And once that month came in, I was able to pay for bills and I was able to pay for my rent. I was able to survive basically barely. Um, And then things just kept getting better and better each month. Um, And it just came from a place of me believing in myself so much. So, you know, even for those who are listening, even if you are aware that you have trauma with money, that there's still a lot of healing to do around money. As long as you have this like unshakable trust and confidence and believe in yourself or at least what you want to manifest, that's already such a key ingredient into you manifesting that thing that you want. I love that. Yeah, I love that too. I think a key takeaway, just which kind of encompasses everything that we've been talking about is that you have to do that inner work and address those inner traumas before also addressing those things that you want to manifest because if you don't kind of clean the peanut butter jar right then you won't be able to fill it back up or or whatever so I think that that's kind of what encompasses this whole conversation is like addressing that sense of lack and just healing those traumas before actually going for what you really believe you can achieve yeah 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 (laughs) I hope that I forgot I was gonna say but like that probably covered everything that I wanted to ask anyways so um but before, like, there was a couple of questions, but I don't want to go over. So before we um, sign off, I guess I kind of want to know what you you are up to with, I know you have your 3C signature program. Um, is there anything else, any other programs that you're offering or offering in the future um, that, yeah, our listeners can kind of come to you for? Yeah, totally. So I actually have a new program since I last spoke with you guys. So I have my baby, my number one baby, uh, which is the three Mm -hmm. C's method. Um, Right now I'm not open for enrollment, but um, for those who are listening in May, I will be open May of 2022. I will be opening up for enrollment again. So if maybe you're listening around that time and you're interested, then go to my Instagram, um, which I know you you guys will probably tag in the show notes. Um, Go to my Instagram and you will you know, you can apply, you can learn more about my program there. Um, Now I do have my new baby, which is called Activate and Liberate. This is a new program that is more so based on -on one-on-one coaching. And it's also more of a spiritual um, program. Mm -hmm. So here I'm actually working with the psychic medium that will be able to- yeah, that will be able to kind of tap in with your spirit guides, with your human design, with your astrology. And together we work together to kind of help heal anything that needs to be healed at an even deeper level. It's more of like a one-on-one personalized approach. Um, and you can learn so much more about it inside uh, uh, on my Instagram as well. And I will be opening up for enrollment next month. So in the month of wow, March, okay. opening up for enrollment. Um, so yeah. Okay. yeah, definitely. So you still have your three C's method and then there's access. That's so method. interesting. I've never heard it like of that before in my life. And that's so that's unique niche and, like, and like, so helpful so definitely we'll be checking that out a thousand percent that's really yeah, cool wow, it is so that's... amazing thank you it's taken off so it's it's doing so well and um I'm yeah sure, and yeah. even for those who may or, or maybe hesitant to even look at the three season method or activate and liberate i do have a really good uh free workshop on my instagram um can you guys hear me still Yep. Can yeah. you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, you froze for a second. Um, oh, no I worries. do also have a, a free workshop on healing, anxiety, depression, and overthinking on the link in my bio on my Instagram. So 
for those who are a little hesitant, hesitant to move into any of the programs that I have, you can definitely just check out a workshop that will help you with your mental health. Um, it's really, really powerful. It's one of like the most requested, most favored workshops that I have so far. Um, but yeah, that's what I've been up to. Okay, well, thank you so much. That's going to be really helpful for a lot of people, I think. Um, I'll definitely check out that one because the, like you said, the psychic medium, like sounds really Yeah, that sounds awesome. <laughs> um, Thank you so much though, for everything today and just helping us with all those points and questions that we have. Every time I feel like, every time I read your post or like the two times that we've actually talked to you, I feel like my battery's like charged after I talk to you. So it's a really good feeling. Just entering like a new mindset after the <laughs> podcast is done. We're like, okay, you're going to take everything and put it to practice. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that. That means so much to me. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much for coming on.